Good evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Kia Coleman and I am the communications director for the Harvard Kennedy School Black Alumni Association. On behalf of the entire Black Alumni Association Executive Board, our membership and our legacy leadership, welcome to this evening's event, a conversation with the Honorable Valerie Jarrett. We are incredibly excited about tonight's dialogue. We have two very dynamic and highly esteemed guests with us this evening. Tonight's moderator, Broderick Johnson, served under two United States presidents. As deputy assistant to the president for legislative affairs under President Clinton, and as former White House cabinet secretary for President Barack Obama. He currently serves as executive vice president for public policy and digital equity at Comcast Corporation, overseeing the company's public policy team and leading Comcast's role in the digital equity space. He has more than three decades of experience as a lawyer, policy advisor, and political strategist and is a highly respected and trusted leader in Washington, D.C. and across the nation. Mr. Johnson has advised hundreds of clients on a wide array of policy issues, including telecommunications and tech matters, and sits on numerous boards, including the, boards of director, the Board of Directors for the Obama Foundation and the Black Economic Alliance. And then there's our featured guest. Our featured guest is the one and only Honorable Valerie Jarrett, former senior advisor to US President Barack Obama from 2009 to 2017. She is the longest serving senior advisor to any president in history. Ms. Jarrett is currently the chief executive officer of the Obama Foundation and a member of the board, as well as a senior distinguished fellow at the University of Chicago Law School. She authored the New York Times bestselling book, Finding My Voice, My Journey to the West Wing and the Path Beyond and the Path Forward. She has a background in both public and private sectors, having served as the Chief Executive Officer of the Habitat Company in Chicago, the Commissioner of Planning and Development for the City of Chicago, and Deputy Chief of Staff for Chicago Mayor Richard Daly, and serves on numerous boards, including the John F. Kennedy Center for the Performing Arts and Lyft. And how about this? Ms. Jarrett has received numerous awards and honorary degrees, including Time's 100 Most Influential People Award. So it is a tremendous honor to welcome you both this evening, particularly as we sit at the intersection of Black History Month and Women's History Month, which begins in March. We thank you so much for joining us during this pivotal time to help us celebrate the incredible history and achievements of the African-American community, to discuss challenges on the horizon of the US political landscape, and to collaborate on how we might begin to think about addressing enduring challenges facing Black communities and our broader society. The Black Alumni Association and Harvard Kennedy School have always been committed to community conversations like this that enable us to study and analyze the past while examining and building the future, a future that supports that stronger union that then Illinois, Illinois Senator and future president Barack Obama referred to so eloquently in his 2008 speech, a more perfect union. In fact, tonight's discussion is the Black Alumni Association's second Black History Month event and community conversation. We had a wonderful dialogue during our State of Leadership series at the beginning of the month with former Federal, Federal Communications Commission Chairman Michael Powell and former Massachusetts Governor Deval Patrick about the state of Black leadership in democratic governance, technological innovation, and digital equity. Tonight, we learn about the professional and personal backgrounds, triumphs and experiences of our illustrious guests and focus our dialogue on our country's political landscape. But before we move forward, let us pause and consider for just a moment the immense and historic value 
of community conversations like the one we're about to have. Let us think about the importance of safe spaces for discussion and thought. For much of this nation's history, slave codes, black codes, and Jim Crow era policies restricted the ability of African-Americans to gather, learn, effectively communicate and organize. But despite this, from the moment they touched the shores of this great nation that they would go on to help build, African-Americans resisted to the very best of their ability, these limitations on gathering, dialogue and free thought. The Association for the Study of African-American Life and History recognizes this legacy through their 2023 Black History Month theme, Black Resistance in the Past, Present, and Future. On African-American resistance, and this includes the fight to establish safe spaces, enable community conversation, and elevate Black voices in all aspects of life. This really brings to my mind historic organizers and conversationalists such as Ida B. Wells, Frederick Douglass, W.E.B. Du Bois, and the countless others in more recent times, like the great John Lewis, who gather communities to speak truth to power. I am highlighting this theme for you tonight because it is a clear and powerful call to action for everyone, regardless of race, to study the history of Black Americans' responses to establish safe spaces and create opportunities for conversation. So we are honored this evening to try to create yet another safe space for conversation and debate. These types of dialogues are a path to celebrating Black history and achievements, while also addressing current challenges facing the community. Beyond that, there are a path for discussion about how we should all continue to push as a community together to hold this beautiful nation to the ideals of freedom, liberty, and justice for all. And there is no better place than the Harvard Kennedy School to have these engaging and necessary talks. After all, it's been said time and time again, it's at the Kennedy School where students, scholars, and alumni from community organizers, business leaders, government officials, to national leaders come to ask what you can do to move theory into action, challenges into solutions, dreams and hopes into plans and strategies. So as you listen tonight to our distinguished speakers, please be sure to engage and share your thoughts. You can type your questions and comments into the Zoom chat. Please join me once again in welcoming our guests. I will now turn this over to our distinguished moderator, Broderick Johnson, who will shepherd us down this path of community conversation. Broderick, the floor is yours. Tia, yeah, thank you very much. And that, that was mag a magnificent introduction to this conversation. And it will be a conversation. And it will be uh, it'll be a warm, engaging, and interesting conversation. I can assure you all of that. Let me begin with a caveat, though, since since Valerie is the CEO of a 501c3 organization, the Obama Foundation, um, partisan political questions and comments have to be off the table. But I assure you that won't interfere with what I know will be a candid conversation about governing, policy making, leadership, mentorship and her time and our time together serving under President Obama. And I wanna add a note of personal privilege to begin with. People oftentimes ask me, what were my most cherished memories of the years that I was privileged to serve in the Obama White House? And there are so many incredible memories, but when I reflect on the ones that, that really, really moved me the most, almost every one of them includes a moment when Valerie and I were in the, in the room so to speak together, whether it was the Oval Office or the Roosevelt Room or the East Room or on Air Force One. So many, so many moving moments. And there were also though the Monday mornings when I arrived for our daily meetings in the Chief of Staff's office, grumpy because I don't like Mondays and especially if it was raining that Monday, but invariably I'd walk into that room in the Chief of Staff's office and I'd see Valerie or Tina Chen or Susan Rice 
and a few others who were very close friends and that mood would shift from grumpy to gracious and, and grateful, I should say, because I couldn't help but be so grateful about the opportunity to serve and to communicate in all sorts of ways with my friends like Valerie. We had like little hand signals and stuff that we would do so we can communicate a little bit more candidly than perhaps we should have. I should also note, by the way, that I was reminded earlier today that this is indeed the ninth anniversary of the launch of the My Brother's Keeper work in the White House. It was launched from the magnificent East Room of the White House. It's work that continues today as part of the Obama Foundation. So it's a wonderful day and it's a great opportunity to have this conversation on this, uh, this anniversary that's so dear to both Valerie and to me. So I'm really pleased with all of that to begin this conversation with my dear friend, Valerie Jarrett. Hey, Valerie, it's great to see you and to spend this time in conversation with you. Good to see you too, Broderick. And you are your usual humble self. What, Bro what Broderick neglected to mention was that my brother's keeper happened under his watch. He was responsible for creating and shepherding through the program while we were in the administration and he now chairs the board, um, advisory board of my brother's keeper to this day. So we would not have been able to accomplish nearly what we have had it not been for Broderick's leadership. So I wouldn't want to let you get by without mentioning that. Thank you very much. Thanks. So let's start off with a, a little biography about you here. So you were born in Iran to American parents and you lived there until you were five years old, I believe. And although you left at such a young age, you talk about how that experience uh, shaped your view of the world and your role in the world. So could you start off talking about that a bit? Yeah, sure. So you must wonder what on earth um, my parents were doing in Iran. Well, my dad uh, was a physician. He grew up in Washington, D.C., and my mother grew up in Chicago. They met and fell in love when my dad was doing his residency in Chicago. They married, and my father joined the Army after he left his, finished his residency. And when he was ready to leave the Army a couple of years later, he wanted a job at a major academic teaching hospital, but as a Black man in the 50s, couldn't find a job. So he and my mom, who are a little crazy, frankly, decided to look for opportunities outside of the United States. Now, they had never been anywhere, except maybe I think they went to Europe one time. But uh, he was offered a job to help start a brand new hospital in Shiraz, Iran. And this was at a time when, for those of you who are not history buffs, the United States and Iran had very strong diplomatic ties. And the Shah of Iran was very interested in improving the healthcare delivery system in the country. And his health department was recruiting physicians from all over the world. So my father was there to help start the Namazi hospital. I was the second baby born in that hospital. Some other baby came first and along came Valerie. And we lived on a hospital compound where I played with children from all over the world. And we you know, spoke French and English and Farsi, uh, mixed them all up in the same sentences. Mm -hmm. And I learned that I could find something in common with anybody, regardless of their background. I also learned to appreciate the United States once I arrived in the United States six years later, for simple things like not having to boil everything I drank and peel everything I ate and worry about illnesses for which there was no cure. And the poverty that I saw in Iran was the likes of nothing I've ever seen in this country. And so I had an appreciation for the United States that I think sometimes people who have not traveled, particularly to underdeveloped countries may not have. And the final lesson I learned was that the United States is an extraordinary country. It's actually not the only country on earth. And you can learn a great deal outside of our shores. And those were kind of the core lessons. But what my parents said to me throughout my life was that had my father not taken that job in Iran, he wouldn't have then secured a job at the Galton Labs at University of College of London based on research he did in Iran. And from there, he was offered a tenure track position at the University of Chicago, the neighborhood where my mother's mother and her sister and whole extended family lived. And so they often said to me that sometimes the shortest distance to where you really wanna go means you darn sure better be prepared to take the scenic route. And they sure took the scenic route going all the way across the world to come right back home. Valerie, your mom is an extraordinary educator, a leader in education. Would you talk about her impact a bit? Yeah, so my mom um, was always a working mother and unusual for um, her time. I will add 
that she's 94 and she literally last semester was the first semester she stopped teaching. She still serves on the board of Erickson Institute, which is a graduate school in early childhood development that she founded along with two other women 55 years ago unheard of at the time. And before that, she had been a teacher in an um, early childhood center. She received her master's from the University of Chicago in education, and she always wanted to professionalize the field of early child development. So she was a role model for me, Broderick, of a working mother. I was always really proud of knowing that she was this trailblazer, um, yet at the same time managed to make me feel like I was the most important thing in the world. So very lucky to have been born to Barbara and Jimmy Bowman. Oh, yeah. Yeah, great, just great pa pa parents, and you, you have such a great family. It's a pleasure to know your family, too. So I'm going to fast forward real quick to in your biography, because you, you went to Stanford University, which holds a special place in, in my heart and in, my, and in my bank account these days. Yes, indeed. And, and, and then, but we met at the University of Michigan Law School. And uh, you were a third year student, and I was a, I was a first year student. And uh, and it was a it was a, a great place to be, but it it taught us something about sort of a path through uh, through the law, right? In terms of the different different things you could do in your career with respect to the law. And for you, um, you started off as a corporate lawyer, and then for a few years uh, you practiced corporate law, and then you went into the private into the public sector into the office of the mayor of Chicago. First of all, what inspired you to want to become a lawyer in the first place? You know, well, Broderick, unlike you, who knows? I mean, I frankly, I think back to my college years, I had no idea. I majored in psychology and I really thought I would be a clinical psychologist. And then my parents kind of talked me out of that. And I thought about going to medical school, but I went to an anatomy class. That was a disaster. And organic chemistry, the two happened the same time. That was the end of that. Um, I slept through the GMATs because there was a good party the night before, which I remember. And I could pick myself for that because honestly, I wish I'd gotten a joint degree. Would have come in handy. I had to learn a lot of business on the job. And my best friend had gone to law school and we're often influenced by people in our lives who we look up to. And I really admired her. And she said, oh, Valerie, just go to law school. You'll figure it out. And so I kind of made up a plan. Everybody else seemed to know exactly what they wanted to do. And so I figured I'd get to law school. I'd discover my passion in the law. And then go home probably to Chicago and, you know, fall in love, get married, have a baby by the time I was 30 and live happily ever after. And as you know, Broderick, I was on that straight path. Yeah. And the subtitle of my paperback book is when the perfect plan crumbles, the adventure begins. Okay. And I think what two things happened. One, I had my daughter, Laura, who's now 37 and giving me wonderful grandchildren. And because I'd always been so proud of my own mom, once I had Laura, I thought to myself, if I continue practicing law at this big fancy law firm, miserable with what I'm doing, will she ever actually be proud of me? Hmm. Wow. And I began my book, like sitting in my office with my back to the door, just crying and thinking this couldn't be my life. I was, I was, am always a happy person with a happy disposition. And I was just miserable. I had married the boy next door, literally. Our moms grew up in the same apartment building. Our fathers were, were friends. He was a doctor. My dad was a doctor. I had a crush on him since I was eight and he was 12. What could go wrong? Oh, well, you don't have enough time for me to explain. Life went wrong. So here I am really miserable. And at the same time, Mayor Harold Washington, who was the first black mayor of Chicago, had just won re-election. And a very good friend of mine, again, you phone a friend when you don't know what to do, said, Valerie, why don't you join local government and be a lawyer for the city and your clients will be the citizens of Chicago, the city you love. And you'll just feel a part of something bigger and more important than yourself. And that coupled with misery just struck a chord. And the other thing he said to me is, look, you can always go back to a law firm. Tried for six months. Well, eight years later, I left. And so I spent four years practicing law. I oversaw finance and development in the law department. And then I moved to become deputy chief of staff and then ran the department of planning and development after that. And then when I left local government, I um, joined the Habitat company, which is a real estate development and management company. But the mayor appointed me to chair the board of the Chicago Transit Authority as well. So I really had eight years full-time and then eight more years part-time in local government, which was an incredible 
training ground for everything that's happened to me since. Did you ever think of going back to a law firm? Seriously? You know what? There was one moment when I was leaving government and I didn't really know what I wanted to do next. And for a brief moment, I thought, well, maybe now that I'm eight years older, I could go and be a partner at a law firm and it wouldn't be the same as being an associate. And I had talked about it with Susan Scher, who Broderick knows very well, who was a very dear friend of mine, who was the corporation counsel at that time for the city of Chicago. And she said, if you even think about it, I will shoot you dead. Um, and she said, it, no, just think of something else you want to do. And so I, do, I have no regrets for not going back. I much prefer the path that um, I took because frankly, I think I'm a much better client having been a lawyer, but I enjoy being the client a lot more than being the lawyer. <laughs> yeah, I know that too. My goodness. Yep. And, and your daughter, Laura, trained as a lawyer, right? And, uh, and she is now the justice, uh, main justice correspondent for, for uh, NBC News, right? The senior legal correspondent. Yes, let's get that right. Yes, for yes, all the big stories. So she actually stayed at a law firm exactly how long I did, six years. And I remember her coming to me and she goes, mom, I'm miserable. I'm like, no kidding. I told you not to go to a law firm. That was her form of rebellion, I think, which is not bad. If that's as rebellious as they get, that's fine. And she just had this passion for telling stories, which is why she wanted to be a litigator. But when she interviewed, she was first at CNN and now she's just recently joined NBC. So she does the mm -hmm. Today Show and Nightly News and MSNBC and goes back and forth between between New York and DC. She's in DC now covering the Supreme Court oral arguments. Uh, but she said, I could talk to 12 people on a jury or I could talk to 12 million people. I think I'll go talk to 12 million people. And unlike me, when I was painfully shy at her age, she is not shy at all. So she's yeah. found her sweet spot, I think. She's tremendous. I saw her, I think it was Friday or Saturday night. She was, I think it was Friday night she was reporting. Uh, yep. There's a lot to report on, that's for sure. Every single issue has legal ramifications right now from the Murdoch trial to everything happening in Washington. So let's go to when you met uh, for former first lady and dear friend, Michelle Obama and her uh, then boyfriend and eventual <laughs> husband and president of the United States, Barack Obama. Could you talk a bit about how and when all that happened and what you saw that was so special in both of them or each of them individually for sure sure so the year is 1991 so 32 years ago this summer uh, michelle robinson's resume was sent to me by susan sure um, and she said across the top susan wrote brilliant young lawyer doesn't want to be at a law firm and i thought well i'd love to meet somebody like that i get her i get her right away and i still remember Barbara. she walked in my office and tall, elegant, but really simply dressed. She had her hair pulled back like this, barely any makeup, shook my hand firmly, looked me dead in the eye, but never mentioned a thing about her resume, nothing about Princeton or Harvard or Sidley Austin, none of that. She told me her story. And of course it's now well known as a quintessential American story growing up on the South side of Chicago, working class parents who hadn't gone to college, but valued education and excellence and giving back and instilled in both Michelle and her brother Craig, these core values. But what she said that really struck a chord, uh, which is why I always encourage people who are interviewing, don't talk about your credentials, tell people your story. Because she said both her mom, both her father and her best friend had died within the prior year. Mm. And it was such a wake up call about the finality of life and the need to have a purposeful life. And it reminded me about the birth of my daughter and that that's what drove me into searching for a greater purpose. And so we bonded around that. I offered her a job on the spot, no authority to offer a job. <laughs> and wisely she demurred. And a couple of days later, I was talking to her and I said, well, what are you gonna do? Are you gonna take this job? I thought we really connected. And she said, well, I got bad news. My fiance doesn't think it's such a great idea. And I'm like, well, who is your fiance? What do we care what he thinks? And she laughed like Roderick is laughing. And she said, look, he started his career as a community organizer. He's not the biggest fan of the mayor. He wants to know who's gonna be looking out for me if I go right from a law firm into a frying pan. Cause I'd had those four years to kind of, in the law department to kind of get ready for the political policy side of what I did. And so she said, would you have dinner with us? And quite wisely, I said, yes. And 
at the end of dinner, two things were very clear to me. Number one, they would be married forever. You could just feel not just the love and the chemistry, but the respect. They listened to one another. And uh, it was clear that they were partners. And the second thing at the end of the dinner, because he talked about his interest in um, public service, but he wasn't sure what path it would take. And right. I thought, oh, what wonderful young couple. I think one day he could be mayor of Chicago. <laughs> yes, good a good thing, but you know what? Honestly, that was my ceiling in terms of thinking about a black man. Is that that's a, that was that you could could do because Mayor yeah. Washington had done it, but I hadn't seen I hadn't seen the path that he took. So, needless to say, he exceeded my early expectations of him in that respect. But there was something extraordinary about that couple, which I think Roger, you would attest because obviously you're very close personal friends to both of them as well. Yeah. It hasn't changed. They are still those same people. And and Michelle said, I'll never forget this, at the 2012 convention, people say to her, what's changed your husband about being president? Uh, what changes have you seen? And she said, no, it hasn't changed him. It's simply revealed who he is for all to see. That's and true. I think, you know, they've grown, they've matured, but those, those core values, that commitment to service, that commitment to the greater good, the kind of humility with all the talents that they've been given, that's just the same. And they're just no, normal. They're, yeah, normal. they're just normal. Yes, that's right. And they're just normal people who, who can laugh and be silly and be yes. emotional and, you know, and and uh, like with uh, with President Obama, when he and I talk about our kids going off to college or law school, like we we cry like two two <laughs> young boys, right? It's like, but it's just so. You're right. The most important things haven't changed. About he, did, he did mention to me today, Roderick, that you keep sending him videos of your grandson. <laughs> did, yeah, I sent him a video of my grandson flipping over from, <laughs> and, I, and like I, you know, I try not to send him one every day. <laughs> so, but once a week. Because they change know, every week at that age. You got to send them every week. You just wait and see how many videos he sends, right? When, <laughs> oh when my gosh, I, he's going to be, he's exactly. going to be worse than both of us. You know, Valerie, I think um, I, I, I hope there are times when you sit back and, and, and really relish what the contribution you made among so many others, but the particular, the particular one about having served not just for President Obama for eight years, but to be the longest serving senior advisor of any president in the history of the United States. Like, you know, that's that baffles me. And I didn't even know that until 60 Minutes did a piece on me and they told me they did the research. And I'm like, really? Why was anybody yeah. late? And and I think you look, know, Roger, you came in a little later, but would you have left if he'd had another term? No. Why would you ever leave when you're old enough to know you have the best, most exciting job you'll ever have and terrifying yeah. and stressful and emotional and intense in so many different ways? But you can't recreate it. And so squeezing every last minute. In fact, I joke with the fact that I don't like the cold. So when the Obamas were at the inaugural parade, I scooted into the West Wing to find out where my office was and avoid that parade. And at the end, as you know, Broderick, I went over to the East Wing when um, they had those last few minutes in the White House. And when they left for the inauguration, Tina Chin, who you mentioned earlier, and I walked out together and the Secret Service was like, you all have to go. It is like, <laughs> minutes to 12. you're about to turn into a pumpkin here. But it was really hard leaving uh, because it was just such an extraordinary eight years as, as hard as those years were. And they were very hard given everything going on in the country and, and the pressure of working for a first. There's just some unique pressure when you are the first and you don't want to mess up and screw it up for everybody else who comes along. And you know that you're being judged by a very different standard where you now when he wears a tan suit and that's controversial compared right. to some things that happened after he left. Yeah. Before and after. Right. Before and after. After. Yeah. yeah. No, no, no question. It's funny. My daughter was the one who convinced me when it was time to go, you know, it was the last days and she came over to do her homework one day, like let's say January 15th. And we were leaving on the 19th and she came in my office and she noticed there were like pictures that were barely still hanging on the wall and there were boxes. She's like, dad, this is really depressing. You need to go. So that's all I needed was like for her to say that. And I was like, yeah, you're right. 
is it time. Was to go. Those last few days, because what I what I hadn't prepared for, maybe you did, Barbara, because you've been in the Clinton administration was, I mean, many of the people had been there, if not all eight years for, you know, varying times, some I knew from the campaign. And you begin to realize when the first people leave, because not everybody stays till the 20th. In fact, 99% right. of the people are offboarded from December until the 19th. Yeah. So every day you're saying goodbye to people that you've shared this extraordinary experience with. And it was, it was really hard to keep saying goodbye to people every single day, knowing that eventually it's over. And even, you know, my colleagues who've gone back in and Roderick and I know a lot of folks who were in the Biden administration, but it's a different administration. It's just never the same again as that right. first time I think that you're there, particularly working for somebody who you care so deeply about as a friend. Exactly. So the, you're doing so many things now. I want to just highlight and mention uh, uh, those things. Of course, you're the current CEO and a member of the board of directors of the Obama Foundation. You're a singer, senior distinguished fellow at the University of Chicago Law School. You serve on a variety of nonprofit and for-profit boards, including Aerial Investments, the John F. Kennedy Center for Performing Arts, LIFT, your co-chair of the United States of Women, and your board chair of Civic Nation. And you do many other things as well. How, how do you how do you balance all those things really and keep them all sort of in line? Is it um, you've got like lots of staff people, but for you, how do you do it? How do you so this is what I do, and you didn't mention like about Walgreens Boots Alliance and Ralph Lauren yeah. and Sweet Green, and so this okay. is my litmus test. Po post White House, um, I thought to myself, at this stage of my life, I'm only going to be around good people, and I'm only going to do things I care passionately about. Yeah. And so my litmus test for everything I commit to do is, you know, are the people around really good and decent? Do I share their values? Do we have a similar work ethic? Am I going to worry about whether they're misbehaving? Particularly when you serve on corporate boards, you've got to, you know, the most important thing is to pick a CEO in whom you have confidence because you're not there day in and day out, but your reputation is attached to that person. Sure. Um, and do I care passionately about their products? I mentioned Walgreens because I like I've been Walgreens every day. I have been a shopper at Walgreens my whole life. I love that store, and I use Lyft all the time. I don't have a car in New York, and so I'm a consumer. Yeah. So and Aerial Investments, my dad, they're now a 40 year old company. My father was their second investor, second to John Rogers' mom, who was the first investor. And <laughs> John and I grew up on the same block. He's like my one of my oldest and dearest friends, and so. Yeah. So I make the decisions and then I will say this, you name everything I'm doing now, I don't work nearly as hard as I did those eight years. And so I think because the stakes are just different and even though at the foundation, you know, President and Mrs. Obama are very ambitious in terms of what we get, what we can accomplish, but the pressures are just different. And I think I'm better organized and I'm older and I'm really good at, uh, focusing on what I'm doing now and not trying to multitask, but really being present and engaged. And that's a lot easier to do when you care a lot about what you're doing. Yeah. Also, I would observe, I certainly saw this in the White House, and I know it to be the case now, you know how to hire a really good team of people. That I do. Who do their jobs do. really well and are very know. loyal to you, and the standards are very high. And that, of course, makes a huge difference as well. All my life, I've looked for really talented people who will cover my weaknesses and help me, you know, be prepared. And that, and you're right. And I think you too. We've had we had great great teams, both people who were on our teams, but also the collegiality we had at the senior level with our colleagues was the likes of nothing I have ever experienced yeah, before. And they're they're part of a great now. Yeah, they're part of a great pipeline now as you see them going into those those uh, very senior positions all over. Yes. Government and yes. The sector. You say, yeah, I knew that. I knew that person would be that back good. Back in the day. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Back in the day. Yep. Uh, can we shift a bit sort of to the political landscape? And of course, sure. we're not going to get into partisan politics, but I do want to start off with a kind of question of what makes you, because you're always very optimistic. Right. Again, there those Mondays when I would come in all grumpy, you'd make me feel happy about the fact that it was a Monday. Uh, I'm also a morning person. <laughs> By eight o'clock <laughs> at night, I was pretty grumpy like you were in the morning. <laughs> but your optimism. Yeah. And your position. And it's it, you that holds true about the future even of this democracy and everything we've we go through, we've been through. 
Yeah. What makes you so optimistic about our democracy and our government institutions? Well, first of all, I'm a student of history. And I know our democracy has always been messy. We've always taken a few steps forward and a step or two back. And, and there's nothing that we've accomplished as a country in terms of progress where you are disrupting the status quo that wasn't hard. And one of the lessons I learned in Washington that I hadn't appreciated fully in Chicago in government was that there is a stranglehold hold on the status quo. There are people who really benefit from things being just the way they are. And if you are a disruptor and you're gonna come in and make be a change agent, it's not easy. And there are a lot of strategies that we tried to put into place to push that pressure for change. But one of the challenges of our current times is it's becoming harder and harder for people who are in positions of power to work with each other and find that common ground. And so what gives me optimism right now is not so much what I see in Washington, but what I see traveling around the country and the people who participate in the Obama Foundation programs who are always skewed younger. And that younger generation, they're energetic, they're smarter, they're better connected with one another. They do need to like loosen up on that addiction to their phones, but their phones are what gives them this incredible breadth and depth of experience. Um, and the ones that are a part of our programs are really committed to inclusive value-based leadership. And so to have the chance to help them unlock the potential that they have is just a tremendous joy yeah. for me. And the more time I spend with them, the better I feel. Well, can you talk about the democracy forum that was held uh, several months ago by the Obama Foundation and what that, yeah. you know, achieved? Well, one of the, one of the, um, thrills about the Obama Foundation is, is that it is evolving. You and I, Broderick, are in there on the ground floor. Yes. And when President Obama left office, he wanted to have leadership programs. And we have programs in Asia and in Africa and in Europe at Columbia University and the University of Chicago. And we're launching a US leaders program as we speak. Applications are in. We have a scholarship program for a hundred young people from across the country, their second and third year of college uh, who are interested in going into public service. And so, so much of we what we've been doing has been directed at helping this next generation of leaders. What he did not appreciate when uh, he left office was that our democracy would be in peril and that the institutions that are the very foundation upon which it rests were gonna be shaken. And the institutions of government, of business, of civil society, all shaken to their core. And so the question he said is, look, I don't think we can take it for granted that our democracy will be strong. And let's look at what are the challenges to a democracy looking through history and looking at what ha is happening in our country. And so for example, the first issue he took on was disinformation. Big challenge in this current climate because at least you used to be able to agree on, here are the facts. Yeah, you right. can policy, but there was a common understanding of the facts. And that has changed for a whole variety of reasons. And I recommend all of you go online on our website at the Obama Foundation, obama.org, and look at the speech he gave out at Stanford, where he talked about the steps that we can take in business, in legislation, uh, in the not-for-profit world, and also each individual citizen to get rid of this disinformation that we see so prevalent. Inclusive capitalism, that's going to be the topic of our next summit that we have um, this year. Mm -hmm. In every democracy that has shattered, you've ended up seeing a separation between the rich and the poor and a hollowing out of the middle class. What do we do to make sure that we are building that healthy middle class? And given the pressures of technology and AI, you can just see jobs evaporating before our very eyes and it will innovation fill them up and will there be an opportunities for everybody? And he's really been very interested in this for a long time. And so we're gonna drill it down on this this year. And so last um, November, as you mentioned, we had a forum where we featured our leaders, these amazing young people in dialogue about how to strengthen democracies both here and abroad. And so every year we wanna have this conference and for at least the foreseeable future, it's gonna be dedicated to strengthening democracies. Mm -hmm. And there has been a erosion around the world of democracies and then there's been a nice swing back. And so again, being older, you appreciate that kind of long arc of the moral universe and mm -hmm. our opportunity to push it towards justice. Right, that's right. Look, you know, we were able to see in the incredible successes that democracy can bring even in the most contentious situations. So. 
just sort of back back down memory lane a bit and thinking about those moments in the White House. And over the course of eight years, it'd be hard for you to really narrow it to fewer than a hundred probably, but just talk about perhaps a couple moments that you think back on and really cherish the most as days when you just felt like, oh, I'm so fortunate to be part of this. Yeah, so one of them would be the night that the Affordable Care Act passed. And we had been working on this forever. And, and as a minor story, I will tell you, there was a real low point. This says something about how President Obama motivated his team. There was a low point where we thought it wasn't gonna pass. And there were several of his advisors who thought he should throw in the towel or just try to cover children, some compromise. Yeah. And he, he's, we were in the Oval Office and he said, to the legislative director who he was encouraging to figure out how to get this done. He said, Phil said to him, well, I don't think it's gonna work, Mr. President, unless you're feeling lucky. And President Obama got up and he walked over to the window and he said, Phil, what's my name? And Phil goes, <laughs> President Obama. And he goes, no, no, what's my, what's my name? And Phil just looks at him and he says, it's President Barack Hussein Obama. So we're like, oh yeah, that is your name. And he goes, where are we? And uh, we're like, we're in the Oval Office, sir. <laughs> and he goes, you're asking me if I'm lucky with a name like that for me to work here? Of course I'm lucky, go back to work and figure it out. So we did. And the night had passed, I'd gone home to watch it on television with Susan Schur, who lived across the hall from me. She was uh, doing healthcare legal work at the time for us in the White House. And we're getting ready to watch it on TV and the phone rings and it's Katie Johnson, President Obama's assistant. She said, President Obama would like for you to come back to the White House and watch it here at the White House. And we lived about 10 minutes away, but we were in our PJs and we're like, yeah, no, we're good. So she said, perhaps you didn't hear me. President Obama <laughs> would like you to come back. And Susan and I both who've known them forever, were like, oh, that's right, he is the president. I guess we better go back. We go back and we're glad we were there. We watched it with everybody. It was a great celebration. He goes, come on up to the Truman balcony, everybody. Well, there were a hundred people in the room and fortunate for him, Michelle Obama was out of town because he would have never gotten away with that. But he invites everybody up to the Truman balcony and he goes and he thanks every single person who's there from the vice president, then vice president Biden, down to the junior person on my staff who was responsible for finding real people, which was what we gave to the names of people who would actually be affected by these policies we were sure. considering. And at the end of the night, I'll never forget, he was thanking Nancy Underparl, who was a staff person, senior staff person on his team who really was responsible for getting this done. Oh, and he yeah. said, you know, Nancy Ann, without you, this wouldn't have happened. And so after that, it was at two in the morning by this point, um, I had one martini. I won't tell you how many he'd had. And <laughs> I up to him. And I said, how do you feel? I said, this is such an extraordinary night and you seem so happy. How do you feel tonight compared to election night in Grant Park, where we were there in front of the entire world and you won this election that nobody thought you were going to win except a few of us. And he looked at me straight away and he said, there's no comparison. Election night was simply a means to get to tonight. Wow. I thought that's Ooh. why I left Chicago and followed you here because he understood this was never about him. This was about what he could do. And then those moments when his advisors and Project, you know their names, were saying, your poll numbers are dropping. And, you know, why don't you just stop doing this? And he said, what's the point of having political capital if you're not willing to use it yeah. for the greater good? Yeah, and no. today, millions of people have health care. Who that's wouldn't right. have it but for him? That's right. What do you wish we'd been able to achieve that that we didn't? I mean, you know. Yeah, I'll especially. tell you three big ones. Three big ones. One, which was in my court and my basket. So I obviously I take it quite personally, and that was criminal justice reform. You yeah. know, Frederick, how hard we looked at all of the different ways how to keep people out of the system, and that's everything from like school suspensions and expulsions to my brother's keeper to reforming the relationship between police and the black community, to fairness and sentencing. And we try to get legislation to reduce non-violent drug offenses, the mandatory minimum sentences that go with those. And we didn't get it done and we were so close. And we had 80 votes in the Senate, which is unbelievable. And then politics stopped it. Right. I regret that. Comprehensive immigration reform. Again, we were so close. We had a commitment of the then speaker to move forward after the primary elections back in 2010, and 
when those primary elections, no, 2014, sorry, when those went south, we weren't able to do that. And then finally, legislation to keep guns out of the hands for people who are a threat to themselves or to others. And two thirds of the people who die from gun violence in our country commit suicide. And that's like a little known fact, but not to mention this epidemic, public health epidemic of gun violence that we have around our country. Yeah. And yeah. those are the ones that hurt the most that we, we couldn't get done. Those were the times too, when there would be an event at the White House about gun violence and he would bring in the families, especially oh. Oh. where it would be so, as you know, so deeply emotional, right? From him, he couldn't help but feel the pain that he felt, that you felt yourself too, in the sense of, you know, why can't we get this done? Yeah, but we should tell everybody, which obviously, Broderick, you know, my brother's keeper grew out of his incredible anguish after the death of Trayvon Martin and the exoneration of George Zimmerman. And right. he went to the briefing room and he said, we should all do some soul searching to figure out what we can do to improve the trajectory of the lives of boys and young men of color. Yeah. And out of that, we created My Brother's Keeper. And so those moments of anguish did not debilitate him. They just made him more determined than ever. Yeah, our, you know, uh, the the moment then that that uh, related to my brother's keeper that I think about with just incredible um, fondness is the day that it was a typical White House Tuesday. I love Tuesdays. No, uh, it, was a, it was a Tuesday and he had a schedule, right? A pretty, pretty full schedule, a very full schedule. His schedule was always full. But we had to my brother's keeper. Uh, young men, our White House group in the in the Roosevelt Roosevelt Room for a resume writing workshop, and we knew he was going to come in and say hi. But he came in and he sat down, and he like went around the table and talked to all sixteen. As you said, he would talk to everyone to give them an opportunity to tell him something that he wanted them to share about themselves. And at the end of that, one of the young men said, "Mr. President, when are you going to play basketball with us?" And he said, how about right now? And so, of course, the chief of staff, Dennis, and the Secret Service and all the rest of us were like, he has a schedule of like all these meetings still. Yeah. But for the next hour and a half, nothing mattered to him more than to be with those young men. And the joy in his face is in that picture, that iconic picture of him walking down to the basketball court with them. I mean, how good does, how, how good does it get? right? Better than that. It was incredible. It was an incredible moment. It truly was an incredible moment. And so you'll that. remember that for Father's Day, we invited a lot of those young guys to come back to the White House and they gave him a Father's Day card. And one of the young men said, I've never signed a Father's Day card before. And President Obama mm -hmm. said, neither have I. And I think at that moment, they didn't even know that he had had, was raised by a single mom. Oh. So those are the moments where, yeah, you know, his life experiences really did prepare him to be a rather unique president. No, no question. You know, there were, speaking of bipartisanship, it's, of course, it's been tested. And there were people who would, uh, you know, some of the Monday morning quarterbacks and the pundits who'd say, well, you know, on the Democratic side, if only President Obama had worked only with Democrats, we, he could have gotten, you know, even more things done. And then the flip side of that, people saying, well, he didn't try to get Republican support enough. From your vantage point, like, what would you say about his efforts to, you know, work both sides of the aisle and, and to get things done? Yeah, well, so first of all, um, the way our democracy works, you cannot pass legislation without a supermajority in the, in the Senate and a majority in the House. And we didn't, we'd never had that kind of filibuster proof um, majority that we needed. Um, and in the beginning, let's face it, sometimes our own party were our worst enemies in terms of sure. the Affordable Care Act. We had people in our own party who were determined to get a public option, myself included. I put myself in that camp. But hey, guess what? We couldn't get it. And you can't just say, okay, therefore, we're not going to do anything. But a lot of people were really annoyed that we didn't get the public option. And on the Republican side, as you know, Broderick, I got a lot of criticism for working with Republicans on immigration reform and criminal justice reform. But guess what? We didn't have enough votes to pass it without them. And I think, again, back to those early childhood lessons that I had in Iran and that Barack Obama actually had in Indonesia, which we talked about on that first dinner. You have to go in the room figuring out 
with the attitude, I might disagree with you on 99 issues, but I work with you on that hundredth issue because you're there to get things done and make things better. And he used to always say to us, don't let perfect be the enemy of the good. Good is better. Better, yep. Good is better. And I think part of the challenge in our current climate without having a political conversation is it has gotten really hard for people to think it's okay to compromise, to think it's okay to work together. But we have a big, complicated, diverse, richly diverse country, I would add. And you're never gonna get that much done if you just do a go it alone. And one of the reasons, for example, he always resisted executive orders is knowing that the next president can come in and reverse it. I mean, the DREAM Act, we tried to pass legislatively and he signed DACA only when we were sure we were never gonna get the legislation passed. Right. And so the realization about the limits of the power that the president has and his need to work with both the House and the Senate it's the democracy is set up to encourage people to compromise. And most people in the country are somewhere in the middle. Yeah, absolutely. And so it's not a bad thing to say. And also to say, hey, I'm going to get a half a loaf and then I'm going to come back and fight for the rest of the loaf on another day. I mean, every major piece of legislation has been improved with time. Absolutely. That's right. And, and so one of the things we want to do is start having better lessons about democracy, which is the point of the forum. So people can really understand what it does for our lives and what losing it, what's at stake here if we lose it. That's right, that's right. And it includes listening to people you disagree with. So you can try to find some, a common ground that exists in many cases. Listening most closely to those with whom you disagree. And you know what, not only can you find common ground, you might change your mind. You, or minimally, your argument will be stronger because you've had the pushback. Right. And I think that sometimes we get into our own little safe cocoons and it's so much easier now with technology that you don't, I mean, I, and I worry about young people, who, particularly those who are, who grew up with these devices, that they're not forced outside their comfort zone. That's right. They curate their community. My community was my neighborhood. And if I got into a fight with a neighbor's child, well, then I had to go settle it on my own out there. And my parents like, unless you were bleeding, figure it out, work it out and learn those skills of interpersonal relationships. Right. You couldn't shut people out in the same way and create the and just go and live in that community of like minded people, yes. which is what so many, so many people can do now. And That's what you can do. And you're missing a really important um, tool yep. that will help you in life. Yep. So I, I have one more question for you. Then I think we have time for one or two questions from the folks here. So, but okay. Um, so in your memoir, Finding My Voice, you talk about your personal passions and navigating personal challenges, including um, your fear of speaking up, which is speaking at all, <laughs> at all, which is extraordinary. But so then, given all that, what advice would you offer, especially to women in leadership? about finding their own voices based on your own view of all this and your own experiences? Well, okay, so on the spectrum of shyness, I was on the extreme side of shyness, okay. painfully shy, never liked to get called on in class. Law school was agony for me because you can, I can, first day of law school got called on twice, agony. Oh. Oh. And I was pushed outside of my comfort zone when I finally had a job that required public speaking. But it, it was terrifying for me in the beginning. And then I had to practice. And I, I mean, I just, I had no choice but to keep at it and keep going out there and keep doing it again and again. And sometime over the last 30 years, it got good to me. And now I like to talk, as you can tell. <laughs> um, but it took, it, so the, the realization that just because you are one way today doesn't mean you can't work on it to improve it is one lesson that I am an exhibit of. Number two, for women in particular, most decisions that get made in meetings get made before the meeting begins. I mean, once in a while you get in a meeting and you'll noodle things through, but what I found most effective is I would go and talk to people before the meeting started. And you yeah. and I, Roger, did that a lot. We would plot and plan and go into the meeting and you know who your allies are. Yeah. And then the other really important thing, and this, um, this is, this is like the most fundamental thing I could say to you. Everything in life is about relationships. 
There's just simply nothing you can do on your own. And relationships require the development of trust. And I, when I first started working for the city of Chicago, and I would show up at a community meeting, like, I'm here from the government. I'm here to help you. I gave up this fancy job. You should appreciate. Nope. Girl, they'd say, bye, Felicia. They don't care about any of that. They'd say, <laughs> Why should I trust you? I don't even know you. And what I learned, not only is a job 24 seven and that wherever you are, you're on, I'd be in the grocery store or taking my daughter to the park, you're fair game. And that's as it should be. And I learned that it was on me to earn the people's trust. And I would say, as you know, Broderick, in the beginning, President Obama always says like, he had the best players on the field. And at the end of the first term, he had the best team. And that takes time. And so part of what I always say to people is get to know the people with whom you work, have them tell you their stories. And, you know, we were, we always had meals together. Like we're all, we, Roderick and I like to eat a lot. Um, first time I came to your house, I had, I met your children. This was early <laughs> in time. And you have a whole different sense of somebody once you meet their children and you see how good the food is. And yeah. I mean, that's really where I think you and Michelle and I clicked was you, we, that first time you guys had me over. Right. And, and when I lived in Chicago, I entertained all the time. I always had people over. And so that's the other thing I say is, is if you're shy and you walk in a room and somebody you just had dinner with the night before is in that room and they're like, like we used to do in those meetings, we were always encouraging each other on. It gives you courage if there's safety in numbers. Absolutely. Yep, for sure. Uh, Kia, so uh, do we have any any uh, questions in the chat? We have we only have two minutes, so we could do one question unless Valerie answers it really quickly. You're on, you're on mute. One question. Okay. Uh, one question that we received was uh, to ask Ms. Jared about to reflect on candidate, candidate, then candidate Obama's speech on race in 2008. Yeah. And yeah. what was she thinking before the speech, during the speech, and maybe in years since the speech as you reflect back on its um, importance? I'm so glad that's a really good question because there was a great deal of disagreement among his senior advisors as to whether he should even give the speech. And interestingly, it broke down along racial lines. And Joshua Dubois, who was his faith advisor, and I were the only two who thought he should give the speech. And the reason I thought he should is, I thought he could explain not just Reverend Wright, but the Black church in a way that people outside of the Black church may not get. And that if he didn't explain it, he wasn't gonna win. So this was an existential threat to his presidency. We all viewed it that way. But interestingly, which is why it's so important to have a diverse team around you, I think, honestly, my white colleagues were just terrified and they didn't understand it. So they couldn't figure out what could he possibly say to explain the situation. And he said, trust me that I'm going to I'm going to do it in a way where people can hear me and they'll learn something about me that they didn't know before the speech. And I remember I went to the speech, I sat next to Michelle on one side of me, Marty Nesbitt was on the other side of her and Eric Holder was next to me. And Eric Holder often jokes about right before the speech, he, we were all backstage and we were nervous because who knew how the speech would actually be received? You know, it seems like a great speech after the fact. And uh, President Obama and Eric were talking about sports, some basketball game the night before. And when we go to sit down, Eric goes, I can't believe he's talking about basketball before he gives his <laughs> most important speech of his life. How could he do that? And when he finished the speech, we went backstage. He said, I think that worked. <laughs> and he was right. It did. And, and I think people just learned something about him that they didn't know. And part of what I think you have to get really comfortable with when you put yourself in the public square is it's open kimono. You, if people don't know you, like if I had not heard Michelle's story, and the essence of these painful deaths in her family, I probably might not have gone to dinner with her fiance, right? But being willing to put yourself out there, and that's what he did in that speech. And I think a lot of what he said in that speech was a lot truer than people maybe appreciated at the time. And look, what he said about his grandmother, who, who was white, for those of you who don't remember, and how she would like cling to her purse in an elevator. I mean, he, he touched on a lot of real hot buttons that are the core of why we have 
the situation we have today in our country. And so I would encourage anybody who's interested to go back and take another read. It aged very well and answered yeah. the question about how do I feel about it today. That's for sure. Thank you for sharing that. And, and thank you both for being with us this evening. I mean, I, I feel like we, are, we were all on the edge of our seats listening to your reflections and just this part of history that you've been a part of. It is inspiring. It is amazing. I want to go out and find some, something else to do, someone else to serve um, to, for the common good. And we just thank you so much. As we close out, I'd like to offer each of you the opportunity to share any closing thoughts that you have or, or takeaways that you'd like us to have before we leave. My only closing one is I think you all can see and hear why it was that Mondays became a lot better for me <laughs> after seeing Valerie and having a chance. Really, it made an incredible difference, not just on Mondays, but every day. And I'm grateful for this opportunity to have this conversation with my dear friend and sister. Well, thank you, Broderick. And I guess what I would say is, and it builds off the point um, that you just made, Kia, which is that each and every one of us can do something. And part of our goal at the Obama Foundation is to make it easier for people who want to serve. And it could be something like being a mentor or tutoring in a school or helping change the world. You know, anywhere on that continuum, there's something each of us can do. And so I ask for your support of the foundation as we get up and running. And those of you who want to visit Chicago in three more years, you're going to have an incredible campus that you own. I mean, the people of America who elected a president and, and he served for two terms, he belongs to every American, even not just those who voted for him. And this center, this foundation is really at the essence of what he and Michelle Obama are all about. And I want everyone who's in this audience to feel an ownership interest in that and a feel of empowerment by that. Yeah, and support the foundation. And support the foundation. We need you. We do. Thank you so much. I, I want to support the foundation and I'm sure you've got many other people on this call who will be reaching out um, how yeah. they can help. Absolutely. Welcome. Um, in closing, on behalf of the Harvard Kennedy School Black Alumni Association and the Harvard Kennedy School Office of Alumni Relations, we just thank you again for this um, safe space that you've created and this wonderful conversation. And we hope that we can stay in touch with you. This was inspiring. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you all. Thank you. Be well, be safe. All right, take care, y'all. Good night. Good night. Good night.